So, ladies and gentlemen, yep. thank you very much for joining us today. I am Dr. Hassam Jamil, and I am extremely happy and very excited to introduce to you all our guest for today's talk, Dr. Aman Arora. I gave a um, detailed introduction about him on a post I made a few days ago. He is a general practitioner based in Birmingham who is now full time into medical education. He does uh, online teaching uh, on various uh, exams, in, which include PLAB and the MRCGP, AKT part, and he is uh, very popular on the internet for his uh, medical education uh, activities. So I won't take any more of your time. If you have any questions, please message them on the chat box or in the comments of the Facebook link. Uh, and let's get it started. Over to you, Dr. Aurora. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Hussam, for the introduction. Thank you for inviting me to have a quick chat about PLAB and GP training. There are areas that I have a lot of passion for in, in helping doctors get through in terms of these challenges and obstacles in the career. So thank you so much for giving me the platform. It's a great platform that you've got. I'm a member of your group, and I know that you offer a lot of uh, really sound, practical, topical, uh, non-exaggerated advice. And I, and I think that's uh, a credit to you and, and, and I'm sure everybody who is in the group finds it of uh, a lot of value and great value. So thanks to, for doing what you do. Uh, thank you once again for calling me and hopefully we're going to have a, a session that can add some value to people who are thinking about PLAB or GP training. It's quite a lot to cover um, in one bulk, but we'll try and whiz through uh, some core themes. And if there are any questions or queries um, or any areas that you want me to expand on, then I'll be happy to do that as well. So I'm just going to share uh, my slides just to give it a little bit of context. Uh, so hopefully uh, you'll be seeing something coming up now on screen and hopefully um, on the Facebook Live, you'll be getting uh, these slides coming across as well. Yeah, yeah the slides are very clear. We can see them, yes. Yeah. Perfect, fantastic. So the aim of this session, aim, aiming it to be 30 to 40 minutes time. So there's quite a lot to, to cram in, but we'll talk a bit about what PLAB exams are. I know a lot of you guys might be preparing for PLAB. Some of you guys watching this may already have passed PLAB 1 or PLAB 2 or even both. So we'll quickly run through what the exam is and the changes that are coming in the next year with UK MLA. Talk a bit about what GP training is in the UK. There's a lot of questions that I get personally from doctors from different countries asking about GP training, what it's all about, what are the pros, what are the cons, how to apply. Um, the primary care system is very different in the UK to many other countries. So um, it's something that I often get asked about. So I'll try and put some detail on that. The pathway, if you're looking from PLAB to go to GP training to get to the end and you know that's the route that you want to take, what is the pathway that you'll be doing? What are the exams that you'll need to be clearing? How to prepare for some of those exams? And again, I'll ask a little bit about who's on um, who's watching now just to make sure I tailor that a little bit towards the exams that you guys are doing currently. And then hope there might be some time at the end for a bit of Q&A. Um, and I think there are some questions that have come in already. I'd be happy to try and answer them um, as much as I can or as, as in detail as I can. So for those of you who don't uh, know me, thank you, Fessy Hussam, for the introduction once again. I'm Dr. Aman Aurora. I'm a portfolio GP now, full-time in medical education. My 24-7, 365 passion is medical education, not just helping guys like you get through your exams, but hopefully helping you guys reach your potential because uh, a lot of doctors struggle in exams like PLAB and some of the GP training exams and, and actually a few changes here and there, a bit of confidence giving can, can allow you to demonstrate your potential. And that's one of my passions, trying to get you guys not just passing exams, clearing obstacles, but making you feel more confident to ultimately work in the NHS, whether it's as a GP or not. I'm lucky to be a fellow of the Royal College of GPs. I've had lots of previous roles all around medical education. Like I said, my passion is this. Um, I used to be a GMC PLAB2 examiner. I used to be a program director in the GP scheme and a few other things as well, um, and very heavily involved in the IMG uh, scene in the UK. So again, um, hopefully a lot of the questions you might have, I've been asked many times before, and hopefully we can shed some light. And now, as you guys may know, if you have come across this before, we now run Aurora Medical Education and we try and help doctors um, through various stages, whether it's medical school, PLAB, uh, GP or specialty entry, MRC, GP, and ultimately out the other side to becoming uh, GPs as well. And if you have used some of our resources before, please do uh, drop a comment. It'd be great to see whether you guys already know us and how we've helped you uh, in the past. That's a little bit about uh, myself. So I'm going to jump into the first part then. So what is PLAB? Now, I don't know how interactive this can be 
I know there are some of you guys on live. So if you have done Plab, if you have any questions around Plab, please do put them in the in the comment or even the chat on Zoom. I mean, hopefully I'll try and answer those as we go along. But what is Plab? The Professional and Linguistic Assessments Board exam. So basically the exam that the GMC, the General Medical Council set to basically show that somebody who wants to work in the UK um, has the relevant knowledge um, and abilities to, to work within the NHS from um, their first job onwards. It's taken by doctors who qualify from outside of the UK, except for those um, in Switzerland and the EEA. So anyone from India, Pakistan, Bangladesh um, will need to take PLAB, as you guys know, and you're trying to demonstrate those appropriate skills and knowledge to practice in the UK. Of course, the medical training system is very different across the world in different places. And to come and work into a new system, there are certain things from a knowledge point of view, but also application of knowledge that needs to be demonstrated. The PLAB exam is currently the system that the GMC use uh, to demonstrate those skills. And they're looking to see have you got skills and application of skills at the level that, that is the same as what we call the FY program uh, entry at the second year. So we have doctors here who finish medical school, they then do a foundation year program one, and then foundation year program two, and PLAB assesses you at that cutoff between FY1 and FY2 to check that you have those same skills that someone going through the UK system would have. So once you pass your PLAB exams, you get a GMC registration and a license to practice in the UK, and then there are various uh, options that you have that we'll talk about in a second and currently the PLAB exam of course is split into two exams as you guys probably know PLAB 1 which you can take either in the UK or in multiple centers across the world um, and then PLAB 2 which currently you can only take in the UK. So there's a lot of doctors or a lot of medical students who contact me and say um, can I do PLAB am I eligible for PLAB so well, there's some basic uh, criteria that we looked at when you do your application so are you 12 months post uh, graduate in terms of clinical experience at a teaching hospital. This can be in the UK, this can be abroad, but you need that 12 month experience in a teaching hospital uh, before you can apply for PLAB. So you can't take PLAB the moment you come out of medical school, for example. You need a primary medical qualification listed in the WHO directory of medical schools. Now, most reputable medical schools will be on this list without any problem, but I have had a, a couple of people who um, have had medical schools where they're not on that list and they're constantly updating this list, but it's worth making sure that yours is on this list in advance if you're planning to go down the PLAB route. And before you can take the clinical exam, so PLAB 1 or PLAB 2, you have to demonstrate that you can pass the English language test to the required standard that the GMC sets. There are two options that you have, the IELTS exam and the OET exam. Um, IELTS was traditionally the assessment that a lot of people took uh, before. A lot more are going for the OET assessment now. There's uh, talk about it being a little bit more straightforward, um, but you can take one of the two. And, and this is something that maybe you've covered on another talk uh, in the past, but um, that's the first step before you think about taking the clinical part. And people often overlook this and end up getting stuck at these assessments. They start preparing for plan one in advance, maybe year three, year four, year five medical school, and then get stuck at the IELTS and the OET part. So it's worth bearing that in mind if PLAB or the UK route is something that you're looking for. Now, you guys have probably heard about uh, the UK MLA, the UK Medical Licensing uh, Assessment. This is the new assessment that the GMC will be introducing in 2024. It's scheduled for 2024. It was scheduled to come uh, prior to this, but with all the changes that have happened in the pandemic, um, things have been pushed back. So currently, um, the plan is that it comes out in 2024. That might change going forward. Um, essentially, it's the replacement of the PLAB in a way um, it's the new exam that you'll need to be passing to get your GMC registration, to get your license to practice in the UK. Um, but we don't know too much about it yet, um, other than we know it's going to have two parts. So similar to PLAB 1, PLAB 2, there's going to be something called an AKT or an Applied Knowledge Test and the CPSA, which is a, an OSCE-based exam. So we don't know whether how similar it will be one to PLAB 1 and PLAB 2, um, but I, I think there'll be a lot of uh, crossovers. I mean, when you have an MCQ exam number one and an OSCE exam number two, you can see there are going to be similarities. And the whole aim of the UK MLA is that it'll be taken by medical students who qualify in the UK and also doctors who are wanting to come to the UK. So the exam becomes the same, the assessment level becomes the same. And the idea is there's a, there's a, there's a common starting board of assessment before anybody works as a doctor in the UK. And the main difference also to remember is that they'll be looking at assessing your level of competence and knowledge at the level of FY1, foundation year one entry, because medical students in the UK will be also taking this exam, not FY2. Now, how that translates into how difficult the assessments are, nobody knows yet, but it's important to realize that there will be slight differences uh, when it comes to UK MLA. But at the moment, if you're thinking about PLAB, I get a lot of questions from people saying, what should I do? Should I wait 
for UK and MLA, should I start preparing for PLAB now? We don't know what's going to happen. So if you are ready to do your PLAB one or PLAB two, don't uh, let this information or this news block that pathway because even if uh, it changes pathway through your PLAB process, say you pass PLAB one, and then UK MLA comes in, I'm sure there'll be something in place uh, for those doctors who are halfway through the process. So if you're ready to take PLAB or you're thinking about starting preparation, I wouldn't worry too much that UK MLA is on the horizon because um, they'll be aware that lots of doctors will be in the process um, of either preparing for or taking the PLAB exams. But at the moment, we obviously have PLAB still, and a lot of you guys might be preparing for the PLAB 1 exam. So let's start with PLAB 1 first. So like I mentioned, this is a, an MCQ-based exam that can be taken at multiple centers worldwide, um, particularly in South Asia. There are lots of centers in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka. Um, so there's a lot of access to get this exam done without even coming to the UK. There are four sittings per year and you allowed four attempts per person. But as long as you get your preparation right, as long as you understand what's being assessed, as long as you prepare in the right way, then you should be going past attempt number one. This is very rarely happens that I see people get to attempt four. And if it does happen, there's probably issues with technique rather than knowledge. And we'll talk a bit about the differences in a second. Format 180 MCQ based uh, exam, three hours, so you get about a minute per question, um, and it's all single one of five answers. So multiple choice exam, you're choosing the best of five answers. Lots of different domains are tested, similar to kind of medical finals, really, all the different specialties, including things like ethics, um, that may need a bit of revision or review if you're preparing for PLAB 1 right now. The pass mark varies from paper to paper. There's not a set mark that happens every single sitting. It's There's a lot of stats that go into looking at the pass mark for that particular paper, but usually, it's around the 70% mark. And when we talk about preparation for PLAB 1, there's a lot of tendency to just go and do lots and lots of questions. And there are lots of question banks out there, of course. Um, and that's one part of it, doing lots of questions, problem solving. But you need the kind of knowledge backup as well, because question banks can't cover the whole curriculum. If you go to the GMC website, you'll see a document called the PLAB Blueprint that tells you everything that you need to know. So a question bank will find it very hard to cover everything. So you need a dual preparation approach where you do some time doing questions, but also sometimes doing some kind of background knowledge builder, looking through guidelines, going through UK NICE guidelines, for example, the type of things that will come up in this exam. So um, we do train and do prepare for PLAB 1 exams. So if you want to know about our resources, let us know. We can let you know about those. And once you've cleared PLAB 1, then most people go straight into the PLAB 2 exam or try and book their PLAB 2 exam. It's not always easy to get seats for these exams, but the moment you pass PLAB 1, most people uh, try and book their PLAB 2 as soon as possible. This is an OSCE based exam. So this is um, an exam where you are demonstrating skills rather than demonstrating more knowledge side of things. So you have 16 stations in this exam you have to take this in the uk like we mentioned most people take it in the, the gmc building in manchester there have been a few other buildings that have been used um, as well but most people will take it in manchester itself 16 stations um, that you kind of go through in a circuit each station is eight minutes each with about a minute and a half between each station so the total exam time takes around three hours either you get a morning sitting or an afternoon sitting Examiners are either in the room watching you do your consultation with a, a role player, for example, or they may be watching or listening on a remote system. So uh, by video link, for example, or if you're doing a telephone consultation, they'll be on an audio link. Um, but generally, um, in most cases, you'll still get examiners in the room. There was a period during COVID where um, it was all pretty much done with examiners outside the room, but now um, it's getting more back towards how it was. And for every case, assessed in three particular domains your ability to data gather which is very different to doing a history this is understanding core issues that you need to understand as a clinician and how you go about doing that clinical management which involves more than just what the guidelines say but managing the situation as a whole holistically so managing the patient's life issues their mind issues their clinical issues that's going to be tested in your manager side of things and then interpersonal skills how can you build a rapport how can you do this in a patient-centered way are you sharing management options are you asking things with relevance keeping them alongside you in the consultation so these things are assessed in every case that you do so you get a score for data gathering a score for clinical management and a score for interpersonal for each of your 16 scenarios and you get a total score and to pass plab 2 you have to a pass a certain number of stations on that day for example 10 or 11 and b you need to pass uh, your score needs to be above a cutoff score as well and once you hit the both of those then you can pass the plab 2 exam now, once you pass PLAB 1 and you pass PLAB 2, you now essentially are able to work in the UK as a clinician, you have a license to practice, and there are different routes that people then take, depending on 
whether they know where they're going or the research things or whether they just want to test out the system. And there's no real right or wrong option, but a lot of people will go for standalone jobs. So they'll try and apply for um, kind of locum jobs, six month locum jobs in different specialties, maybe specialties that they want to end up in one day or maybe generic specialties like A&E or medicine where they can build up generic skills. Some people apply for the foundation program, like we mentioned in the UK, you finish medical school, then you do a foundation year one, then a foundation year two, and then you apply for specialty training. Some people, when they finish CLAB, even though they're eligible to apply for specialty training, they may want to go back and do some of the foundation year jobs just to get a bit of an idea of how the NHS system works. And some people choose pretty quickly to apply for specialty postgraduate training. And this is possible. There are certain eligibility criteria for each different specialty, but certainly a lot of people uh, want to go straight from PLAB 2 into applying for specialty training. There are pros and cons of this. Um, some people find it quite difficult if their first job is in a training program, they find it quite difficult to, to adjust to the NHS. So some people do some standalone jobs first, some people do clinical attachments to try and get that assessment. So it really is an individual choice, there are pros and cons um, of all options available to you. But the main point of getting to the passing PLAB route is that these options now become available and you can start to plan your career going forward. If someone is going into specialty training, the main decision that people generally have to make is, am I going into general practice, and I'll talk about this in a second, or am I going into specialty or hospital specialty training, for example, you want to be a respiratory consultant or a, um, an endocrinologist or a, a, a pediatrician, for example, so the main decision that I often get um, are, people ask is, should I do the GP route or should I do the hospital stroke specialty route, each specialty itself has a different application process and we had a, a recent careers conference where we had doctors and st1 ing doctors from all different specialties come and talk about the individual application process so if you want to go there just go to our youtube channel we've got a full playlist of all the different specialties but you need to understand what your application process is depending on where you want to go and, and maybe start planning a little bit around the assessments that are coming now, one assessment that you might have heard of is the MSRA, the Multi-Specialty Recruitment Assessment. This is a single assessment that is used as part of multiple different application processes, or uh, currently the number is nine, that may go up in the future. So for example, if you're applying for GP training, or psychiatry, radiology, ophthalmology, um, anesthetics, ONG, um, these are specialties where you need to take the MSRA assessment. There are certain um, specialties and routes training programs that don't use the MSRA, for example, internal medical training or core medical training, core surgical training, they have their own application processes. But the MSRA exam is an assessment that will be taken by most people who pass PLAB 2, unless they're in these specialty applications that they um, that don't use it at this point. But MSRA um, started off with just GP application but lots of other specialties have now started to use this assessment as part of their process so it's an exam that you probably get to to know or you may already be praying for depending on what stage you are um, in your application process so what is the msra it's a computer-based exam taken at various centers across the uk and they're assessing various competencies and you can read through all the things that are assessing you in something called the person specification document remember when it comes to any exam really important to go through the documents that are given to you because they will tell you a lot about the kind of things that you need to do when i see people prepare for things like plab one plab two msra they often just go and get a question bank or just start doing revision but actually they haven't really understood what's being assessed and these kind of documents are very important regardless of which exam you're doing the MSRA exam is split into two papers. You've got a clinical problem solving paper, and you'll probably be used to doing these through medical school finals and through uh, PLAB 1, for example. But then you also have the professional dilemma paper or situational judgment test, where they're assessing your ability to see how do you handle various situations that you may come across in work, working on wards, for example, with patients, with colleagues that don't necessarily have any clinical meaning to them at all. So this is a paper that particularly people often struggle with if you haven't had these types of exams done in the past. So two papers you do on the same day, again, around three hours it takes to get through both of these papers. There's no pass mark for MSRA. There's no maximum score that you need to hit. You are banded for each paper. So band one through to band four for both the clinical paper and the professional dilemma paper. And you're looking to get as high a score as possible because with these application processes, it's a ranking system. So the higher you score in MSRA, the better the choice is, the, the more likely you're going to get the choice that you want to in terms of where you want to train in the UK. 
Now, I've mentioned that the MSRA is used in different application processes for different specialties, and the way that the different specialties use the MSRA differs. So, for example, in GP applications or psychiatry applications, currently, your whole application process is based on the MSRA. So, the only thing that you do is the MSRA exam, and the higher you score, the more likely it is to A, get into training, but B, get a position or place in the UK or a particular training place scheme that you are looking for. Other specialties use MSRA as part of different things to make up your overall application process. So, for example, radiology training or obstetrics and gynecology training, you'll need to do the MSRA exam. Your score will be taken, so the higher you get, the better. But it's not only the MSRA score that tells you whether you get into training or not. You may have interviews, you may have uh, other forms of assessments. So it's worth going um, and watching some of those videos the different specialties on our channel to see exactly what you need for your particular specialty but the msra is quite a generic assessment that you may come across uh, regardless of which specialty you're planning to go into in the future so we talked a bit about plab msra the initial stages any particular questions come up so far that you want me to cover in terms of that before we move into the the next phase of this talk i'll have a quick look at the um the chat for msra for somebody who is in India or Pakistan in their final year of medical school, uh, what would you recommend to them? What sources to use to prepare for MSRA? MSRA, we can say talk about what we what we do for MSRA and how we advise preparation. You've obviously got to try and prepare for the two papers. You've got your clinical paper and you've got your uh, situational judgment test paper. Um, and I think with, with any exam, the dual preparation approach is really important. You need a system where you're constantly doing uh, problem solving by doing questions, whether it's through mocks or question banks, and we can talk about the ones that we use. Um, but also at the same time, you need to be doing some background knowledge. So for the clinical paper, it's more about you know, going through guidelines and going through nice guidelines, mm. particularly if you're um, abroad, um, but also guidelines from a professional dilemma point of view. So going through the GMC, good medical practice guidelines, going through uh, things like ethics of a doctor, for example, those are the kind of things that I'd be looking to. And we can certainly go through some of the resources that we do for MSRA, which try and cover both of those things uh, towards the end. Excellent. Thank you. Great. So maybe let's move into a bit about general practice there, because I do get a lot of questions about general practice. And, and again, it's a concept that um, in some countries, it's in a primary care is a big thing. In other countries, it's not such a big thing. So, um, you know, I can see why people often have questions about this. So let's look, kind of go back to basics. So in the UK, we have two main systems in healthcare, really. You have your primary care system or your community medicine, and around 90% of patient doctor contacts uh, are going to happen in the primary care system. And then you have the secondary care system, so kind of hospitals and community care um, run by secondary care teams. Um, and they're, they're the kind of um, the, the bits that take over the, the bits that the primary care can't cover. So certain investigations, certain treatments, certain assessments, certain management plans that need a bit more um, individualistic care. So you have your primary care system and your secondary care system and general practice essentially is the primary care system of the UK. The bulk of the UK doctor consultations, like I mentioned, are in the primary care system in the UK. And the bulk of doctors who come to the UK will end up being GPs. So it's a very big part of what um, happens in the, in the NHS. So it's something that um, even though people haven't really thought about before they come to the UK, a lot of doctors do end up being GPs in the UK once they go through the various options and go through the various exams. It's known as the gateway of the NHS. So um, a lot of things that reach secondary care have reached secondary care through the primary care system. So somebody's uh, attended their GP clinic, for example, um, they might have had a few assessments, they might have had a few treatments, things may not have worked, things may have got worse, and things like cancer may have been suspected, and then they are referred through to the secondary care system. So in a lot of other countries, people will go directly to a cardiologist or they'll go directly to an orthopedic surgeon. Whereas in the UK, although you can do that through the private system, the majority of people will go through this gateway of the primary care system where 90% of probably presentations can be dealt with in-house and then the rest get um, transferred to the secondary care system. There's a big shift um, in the name of the GP in the past. Um, general practitioner has been seen as a name in its right, but now there's a big push to, to change the naming to consultant generalist because you are seeing pretty much anything that can come in the door, the whole breadth of medicine you can see. So a consultant generalist or, of course, family physician, and that may be a term that's much more commonly used in certain countries across the world, but they all kind of this primary care umbrella. And remember, if you're working in general practice, each GP clinic works, you can see it as an independent 
business as such. So you're kind of running your own practice um, and you're dealing with your own patients, but also all the other things that you need to deal with um, as an independent business as well. So it's slightly different to working in the hospital setting uh, where you work for an NHS trust, um, where you're almost employed by a trust. When you're a GP, if you are a partner or you own a practice, you're essentially running an independent business and you need to be aware of all the things that go alongside running a business as well as running uh, and providing healthcare. Now, I was a GP myself. I, I, I'm not a GP anymore. My father was a GP as well. And I've seen a lot of pros and cons and people often come to me with pros and cons about general practice. So these are some of the, the common ones that I often get asked about. One of the big sort of pros on the left and some cons on, on the right. So one of the biggest draws of general practice, one of the reasons why a lot of people do choose general practice is because of the flexibility. Once you've gone through your GP training, and I'll talk about the GP training uh, years in a second, once you go through that and you come out the other side as an independent GP, there's a lot of flexibility um, available to you in terms of how you now shape your career going forward. You could say, I want to just work Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, full days, or I want to work um, half days only. I want to work afternoons only. I want to do um, some work in the week, but also I want to do some work on the weekends as well. I want to do some urgent care general practice work at night. There's a lot of flexibility in terms of where you work and also how much you work as well. And flexibility could be um, in the geography as well. So you could do a couple of years working in the South and then you, uh, for various reasons, need to move to the North of the UK. You could easily uh, keep working as a GP without too much difficulty because the flexibility um, is there. It's completely kind of, it's completely down to you. Range of medicine is definitely a pro. If you are somebody who hasn't got a burning passion to do something in particular, some people are born cardiologists, some people are born um, I don't know, liver surgeons, for example, if you're not one of those people that have a very strong desire for something and you like medicine in general, there are a couple of options open. You could do acute medicine, you could do A&E, and GP is another one where you get a broad range of medicine. So you could see somebody who was born two days ago as your first patient and somebody who's just passed their 100th birthday as your second patient. It's, it's typical of cradle to grave care. So you see a, a vast range of ages and also a vast range of pathology as well. So you have no idea what's walking in the door. One patient might walk in with depression. The next patient may work in, walk in having an urgent, what seems like a, a, a ruptured aortic aneurysm, you may have the next person coming in with um, severe acne, the range of medicine is immense and some people uh, find that quite stimulating and quite rewarding. Continuity of care is something that I mean, is a big pro for general practice. When you are based in a practice, you may see patients um, for 10, 15 years at a time and you may get to see the development of all of their conditions and how they all merge and influence each other. So um, the content of care, the aspect of uh, putting in an intervention, seeing them a few months later, seeing them a few years later, talking about how things that you started 10 years ago may now be causing problems now, how certain new medications may be interacting with something they've been taking for 10 years. This continuity of care, that knowledge, that in-depth knowledge of their whole history is something that people often enjoy quite a lot in general practice. So if you're the kind of doctor that likes to see progression and seeing stories develop over many years at times, then GP is a great uh, source of that continuity of care. Choosing your working time, like we mentioned, the flexibility element is, is definitely there in general practice. Um, and you get time to do other things. So for example, if you wanted to do other aspects of medicine, if you, for example, wanted, if you have a passion for pediatrics or you have a passion for women's health or you like to do minor surgery, then you can develop other clinical um, aspects of your clinical career. So you may end up doing two days of general practice and then two days in a minor surgery unit or three days in general practice and then two days working within women's health clinics. So you have that ability to develop other skills that you wish to develop from a medical point of view but also a non-medical point of view. So for example, I took the pathway of balancing medicine versus medical education. Now we do fully medical education, but initially there was a balance between my clinical work and my non-clinical work. My wife, Dr. Pooja, she has a strong interest in medical politics. So she had a, a split between doing clinical work and medical political work um, for a number of years. So that ability to, to carve out other areas of practice uh, can sometimes be easier in general practice than when you're working in a, in a hospital setting, when you have a lot of rotors and, and you're working with other things that may make it harder for you to say, drop a day. Whereas in GP, you might just say, well, actually Fridays now, I'm gonna to devote to whatever else I want to do. So definitely some pros there. Are there any cons as well? I'd often see cons as, as it's how you, how you make it really. People say, well, do you miss acute work when you work in a general practice? Of course, if you are, if you love um, emergency medicine, if you love seeing everything out of the acute phase, initial presentation, then you may find general practice a little bit 
uh, different to your needs. However, in general practice, of course, you are going to see lots of acute presentations and often some of the initial acute presentations that need quite quick action will come to general practice first. Some people talk about loneliness when you're sitting in your own clinic all day, you're not interacting with other people. I think in years gone by, perhaps that would be a definite con. I think nowadays with bigger GP settings, with multidisciplinary teams, with lots of meetings, less of a factor now but certainly some people may miss that ward environment that team environment where you go on ward rounds all the time that that's something that certainly you're not going to get every day in general practice people do fear the responsibility you are in essence your own clinician sitting in a clinic dealing with decisions that need to be made maybe on a friday evening without the um, use of having tests that are immediately available to you people see that as a big big challenge and, and, and often a big responsibility and one a little bit too much for them to take particularly early on in their career so that's particularly a con that people often mention to me people worry about becoming de-skilled so if you're not in a hospital setting if you're not doing regular procedures for example do you feel de-skilled I'd argue that you get upskilled in the areas that you need to be a good GP. And yes, of course, you may get de-skilled in certain procedures. But like we mentioned, if you do have a passion for doing procedures, for example, then there are avenues for you to keep those things up as a GP. And some people always come and say, well, all you see is coughs and colds. And of course, some of the presentations that you see in general practice are going to be things that really don't need much intervention. But actually, reassurance is a very strong intervention from a patient's point of view. But of course, you see lots and lots of pathology um, as well as just costs and calls. So it's important to realize um, that even though it can be perceived as a con, um, it's probably not as far as people often talk about. So I might be a little bit biased. Obviously, my career was in general practice, um, but there are certainly a lot of pros. And there are a lot of pros to hospital medicine as well. I'm sure you've had lots of talks um, from doctors in this group um, talking about their own individual um, pros for doing what they do as well. So it's important to get a balance um, and bear both options in mind. But if you didn't know much about general practice, then hopefully this has helped a little bit just to give a bit of a flavor of what it could be. Now, if you do apply for GP training, I'll talk about the application process in a second. GP training is a three-year training program. There are some programs that have now started a fourth year. And if you compare that to a lot of hospital-based programs, which may be six, seven, or eight years, then that's a much shorter uh, program before you become a, in effect, a consultant uh, generalist. So three-year specialty training program for most. In that three years, you have 18 months at least in a GP practice setting. It might be two or three different GP practice settings, but you have at least 18 months training in a practice. And the remaining time, whether it's 12 months or 18 months, you're rotating through different hospital rotations, which will be useful for general practice, things like ENT, things like psychiatry, things like pediatrics, things like ONG. So in your three-year training, you have set periods that are in a practice and set periods that are in hospital training. And both are important for you to end up being um, a well-rounded GP because you need to know a lot about when you're working in hospital settings, what does general practice refer to the hospital setting? What happens when they reach that hospital setting? How do hospital settings liaise with general practice? And that's why doing hospital rotations, even though you're in GP training, is very important. Every year, as you clear each year, just like in any specialty, really, you have to demonstrate that you've done enough, have enough skills, have enough competencies to move into the next level of training. And that means you need to clear what we call an ARCP um, each year. And in your GP training, you have to complete your MRC GP qualification. This is different to any other specialty, really, in that you cannot complete GP training. You cannot progress from GP training if you haven't passed MRC GP. So a lot of the other MRC, MR, Medicare Royal College exams, uh, MRC, MRC, P, MRC, P, MRC, Psych, they're things that you can almost choose to do. You can't become a consultant without them, obviously, but you can go through um, quite a lot of years of work without feeling the need to complete those exams. Whereas in GP training, you cannot finish GP training unless you complete MRC GP. And currently MRC GP consists of three components. You have two exams, your AKT, Applied Knowledge Test, which is an MCQ based exam done in year two or three. And you have your RCA, this is the uh, recorded consultation assessment where you need to record consultations at work and have them assessed by assessors. Um, this used to be called the CSA exam that changed because of COVID. And then you have to pass WPBA, which is workplace based assessments. So throughout your training, you will have lots of in-house assessments done by supervisors and clinical supervisors. And as long as you have to pass a certain number of those to finish GP training. So you have to get MRC GP, but it means that when you finish GP training, you will have MRCGP uh, to your name. You'll be a member of the Royal College of GPs. And as long as you 
pass all of your ARCPs at each year. As long as you get through the three stages of MRCGP, you will end up having a CCT, which means you are a GP and you are registered uh, to work as an independent GP in the UK, whether that means you choose to work as a locum GP or a salaried GP, or you choose to own a practice, you have the ability to make those kind of choices at the end of your training. So it's a very brief overview of the training process itself. There are definitely some eligibility criteria. So uh, we talked about people who just passed PLAB2 applying directly for GP training. For some people, you can do that as long as you have certain pieces of evidence to demonstrate that you are in a position to apply for GP training. So um, some things are fairly normal, like being eligible to work in the UK, having a UK driving license. That's a, an important one. The reason you need to have a UK driving license or equivalent transport arrangement and demonstration of that is that in GP rotation, you'll be doing home visits, for example. So they need to show that you have the ability to go and travel to people's houses. Um, you need to have at least two years clinical experience by the time training starts. So if you're thinking about the application window, which you start about nine, 10 months before you start your job, you need to know that by the time I start training, I'd have had two years clinical experience that could be back home or in the UK, it doesn't matter, but you need at least that to be in place. You need to demonstrate that you have foundation competencies in the three and a half years before you start training. And the commonest way that people do that when they're training abroad is through the CREST form. And I'm sure you guys have heard of the CREST form, the certificate of readiness to enter specialty training. Currently, the 2021 form is a form that you need to get filled out by a consultant that has worked with you, can be back home, to show that you have um, certain skills to allow you to apply for GP training. Now, if you meet all the eligibility criteria and you apply for GP training, that's when you do your MSRA exam. A brief overview of the pathway then for application. So there are two application pathways every year for GP training. There used to be three, it may well go back to three, um, it went down to two in the COVID period, August and February start. So most people will start their training in August and they'll do three years, August to August, August to August, August to August. Some people start kind of halfway through the year in February, and they'll have a three-year plan starting from February. The application process is coordinated by the GPNRO, the GP National Recruitment Office. This is where you make all your applications through the Oriel platform. And they're looking for you to be able to demonstrate certain abilities that show them that you are trainable as a GP. So um, the MSOA assessment is looking to demonstrate skills and knowledge that show an application team that this person is likely to be able to complete GP training because they have these kind of abilities now. It's not assessing, have you got the abilities um, to end at this point, but have you got the abilities or demonstration of suitability to end GP training at this point with the appropriate training? So that's what MSOA is trying to assess. Once you take your um, MSRA exam, once you are called for MSRA, if you're, so you can apply and you, it's called long listing where they check all your eligibility criteria. If that's all cleared, then you take your MSRA exam. And then depending on your rank of your score, you may or may not get a place in GP training. And then you can decide which part of the UK you want to train in based on the ranking that you get in your MSRA exam. So you can see how important MSRA is when it comes to uh, GP training application. Uh, yeah, just wondering if you had any any queries or questions about the GP training application. Yeah, yeah so there, there are some questions about the uh, GP training, actually. So okay. um, there are this, uh, as you mentioned, it's a three year program. Um, the decision about rotations, that which rotations will you get? Do you get any uh, choice in that? Or is it something that is given to you by the deaneries? And in the application process, you'll have uh, the option of firstly ranking your area to work. That's the first option that you have. So you might want to say West Midlands or East Midlands or London or Scotland, for example. And then at a later point, when you have um, got into that area, then you may have the option to choose the different rotations that you that you get. So um, sometimes you have choice and people get what they want. Sometimes people end up getting rotations that they weren't quite looking for. But just remember that all rotations that are in a GP training program are put in there because they are valuable to general practice. So yes, you get some say on, on what you would like, um, but people don't always get the exact combination of what they're looking for. Okay. And if, for example, after you have become a GP, you feel that there's a certain specialty or certain pathologies in which you are not very confident in making decisions. Could you maybe spend some uh, time in those specialties by taking time off? 
Yeah, I mean, certainly a lot of people do this within GP training itself. You don't need to wait to, to, to be a GP because it's likely that in your GP training, if there are any gaps of confidence or knowledge, you, you'll, you'll realize them in GP training because you'll, you'll be doing GP rotations quite quickly and you'll notice that there are certain gaps. Now, you can take action on that by going to sit in certain clinics, for example. If, you're, if you think that you might be weak in pediatrics, for example, then you can go and spend some time uh, doing clinics in a pediatric setting. Um, you may ask for some taster weeks in various rotations where you can get some experience. And of course, when you're a GP, you can do what you like because you have that flexibility. So you may say, well, actually, I'm going to do GP work Monday to, to Thursday. And then on Fridays, I'm going to write to my local hospital and see if I can go and uh, sit in a few clinics with the consultant pediatricians. So you have that option as a GP for sure. But most people will realize in GP training itself that they have uh, gaps in knowledge and as long as you have a chat with your educational supervisor they'll be able to help you fill those gaps because the aim is that by the end of training you should be in a position where you're competent to be an independent gp excellent thank you great so um hopefully that's given a bit of a, an overview as to firstly the club exams and then secondly gp training and gp application now um, there are lots of ways that we help teach for these exams but also keep people up to date with things like application dates and exam dates and you may hopefully have found a couple of these already um, through on social media we do a lot of videos on youtube so um, a lot of our teaching videos a lot of our um, exam update videos are on our youtube channel instagram particularly we do lots of exam updates and lots of guideline updates particularly relevant to plab one plab two msra so if you're on instagram then please do have a look at us there facebook we have a facebook group just like you guys have with medical pearls um, we have a weekly teaching email where every monday we send out a, a quick clinical teaching email with five quick questions and some video answers and then we do lots of regular free webinars as well for plab for msra for careers as well as things like conferences so um, i might well in the chat just put a um actually there's not many in the chat but i might on that post just put a couple of links out if that's okay some for people in case they might want to um, join some of those things going forward people did ask a couple of questions about um the resources that we have so whether it's plab one plab two or msra we have our gold packages which look at training you in various ways looking at both the knowledge and the technique side of it so for plab one for example our gold package contains a full online video course it contains mock exams it contains pharmacology and clinical flashcards it contains audiobooks for using when you're traveling for example and um, so lots of different things in one bundle plab two similar we have a, a live role play course we have an online course audio books flashcards looking at particular things related to plab two and similarly for msra there was a question earlier about how to prepare we have something called an msra gold package which has online courses for both papers audiobooks for both papers mock exams for both papers and also flashcards that cover both the clinical and the sjt side of things as well so for whatever exam you're preparing for we usually have um, a package that covers everything but one thing about our package is that it's not just a, a one size uh, one type of uh, learning uh, style. We realize that you guys have different learning styles and on one day you might feel like doing something and the next day something else. So we try and give you multiple different things to try and really uh, drown in both the knowledge side, but also the technique side as well. So if anyone wants any information on that, then feel free to, to let us know or have a look at the website uh, for some further details. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I can't thank you enough. It's a very uh informative session I, I just wanted to be, be, there are a few more questions that i wanted to ask yeah. from people yeah but before asking them i just wanted to make you aware that in future if you want to post about any of your conferences or webinars uh, on my platform please feel you feel free to do so you will be uh, more i mean i'll be more than happy to you know to uh, approve uh, those posts uh, for you. my group and and that will be helpful for the students as well um, what level of support is provided to GP trainees uh, to develop their specialist skill of interest? Special, okay, so let's talk about two things. There's general support and then there's support for things that you might want to do outside of that. So in general, when you start GP training, you are given an educational supervisor. Your educational supervisor is the person that will guide you from day one through to day end. Um, so the whole three years, So every six months, you'll have meetings with them, you'll go through progress, any questions or queries or needs that you have clinically, you can discuss with them, and they should be able to help you 
find a path to develop those skills. But also every job that you do, every rotation that you do, usually you do four months to six month rotations, you will have a clinical supervisor as well. And if there's a particular area that you think they may be able to help, for example, if you're working in a field that they are a consultant in, then they'll be able to support you and tell you a bit about what you might do uh, to try and develop that skill. Remember in GP training itself, your prime goal has got to be to get to the end of GP training. There's lots to do in GP training, lots of assessments that need to be done. There are two major exams that you need to do. Um, so usually people find that enough to get to keep them busy almost uh, to the end of training. A lot of specialty interests, um, GPs are specialty interests, they start to tend to develop once people have finished GP training because then you have a lot more time to devote to going to clinics, setting up plans, um, working through other exams. Whereas in GP training itself, there's usually quite a bit to get through. So specialty um, things that you want to do and like to develop can be done, uh, but most people would suggest that you, you maybe try and get through the training bit first. All right, so I have checked the comments and chat. There are no further questions. Once again, I would like to thank you a lot for sp uh, sparing your uh, precious time with us. Please in future, feel free to post any of your events on our group. And let's hope that uh, some of the, well, uh, a lot of the students who attended today's talk would soon be joining your uh, academic sessions in the future and would love to become GPs in the UK in the future. Fantastic. Thanks very much. And, and no problem, Isman. Thank you once again for having me. And if people do want to ask questions, I'm perfectly happy to be contacted at any point. Uh, we do get a lot of people contacted us through social media uh, for PLAB queries, but also for GP training queries as well. So more than happy to try and answer them if we can. And thanks once again for, for setting this up and hope it's been of some value. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Bye now. Thanks, Thank Take care. Bye-bye.